I spent last weekend, Labor Day weekend in Florida, and I learned so much about my game. And basically what I learned is that I need to work on hitting low lines more consistently. Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode 27 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I am so excited to have you with me here today. I have some really fun stuff planned for some super helpful content that's going to help you improve your game. We're going to talk about this disc golf skill of throwing low flat lines uh, consistently for distance. We're going to talk about some of those things there and some of my appreciations about that. Like I mentioned last week, we are going to review the Innova Aero. And then after that, we are going to recap Worlds because it was awesome. And then we will preview uh, the Discmania Open in Canada. And next week, we have the MVP Open. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that is this week's episode. I'm sorry that it's getting out a little bit later, but a travel uh, in the beginning of the week kind of pushed me back a few days. But let's go ahead. Without further ado, let's get into it. All right, so like I said in the beginning, Florida Disc Golf taught me one very important skill and gave me so much appreciation for a pro on tour. So I learned that I can hit low flat lines, but it takes a lot more focus um, and there's more error when I try to do it. And that's because playing, learning how to play disc golf in Texas and then coming to Tennessee here, uh, you don't have to always throw low flat lines. In fact, most of the holes, you don't have to worry about it. And here's what I mean when I say low flat lines. I was in Tampa and one of the things that's really big there in the trees, you know, I went to, I was in school uh, for four years in Tampa, but I never played disc golf except once or twice. So it didn't occur to me until as I've been going back over the last few years, Spanish moss is just in all the trees. Now Spanish moss is very light, but um, it is enough to slow down a disc and it hangs several feet off of limbs and branches in the trees. So whereas in Texas and Tennessee, you just have to avoid the limbs. In Florida, you have to throw lower than not only the limbs, but the Spanish moss. And then here's the kicker to it all. You're like, okay, so you have a low ceiling, you know, just adjust to that. Well, in Florida, you also have a lot of underbrush that grows up about maybe three, four, in some places, five feet tall, depending on the, the plants and everything that are growing and what is in the fairway or around the basket. So you're then in this predicament where you have a low ceiling with a high floor, so to speak, where you, ha you can't throw a shot that's just a few feet off the ground and play some nice skip because you run the risk of hitting underbrush. And so basically you have to be able to hit a, like in my opinion, six to 10 foot, you know, six to 10 foot window, meaning low, no, no lower than six feet off the ground and no higher than 10 feet off the ground, hitting that four foot space, that gap down the fairway, hitting it obviously with proper nose angle is the only way to do this consistently and with enough speed to actually get distance. And so this was something that really was problematic for me in the couple of rounds that I was able to play over the weekend because it was something that I was struggling with. I was able to do it, but I was also, I've also been dealing with some nose up issues the last, the last uh, few weeks or so, last several rounds. And I've been dialing that in and figuring out what's going on with that, what I'm doing in my throw that's affecting that. But I mean, when you have such a small window on most holes to hit, um, if you're just a little nose up or you just uh, aim a little too high, you're going to suffer some pretty heavy consequences in your game. And so how can we address this? Because here's one thing that I noticed is that there is a reason why Calvin Heimberg is so consistently good at disc golf regardless of the course he, he's on. If you can always hit that six to 10 foot gap no matter the terrain, no matter the elevation or the conditions, if you can hit that gap of space on every course, you're going to shoot well. 
Obviously, you'll have to adjust for some holes and some and some layouts here and there. But for the vast majority of courses out there, if you can hit that gap consistently, you're going to be 100% fine. And so how do we do that? Well, the first thing is keep that nose down. Okay, it's super important that we keep the nose down when we throw because any slight nose up is going to lift the disc outside of that window. And so there's a couple ways that we can keep the nose down. First is by making sure that our thumb is flush with our forearm, okay? So we wanna keep that thumb flush with our forearm and this does not require forcibly putting your hand down. It's actually a fairly, <clears throat> excuse me, it's actually a fairly comfortable position um, getting the flat of your thumb flat with your forearm. The next thing is that you want to put the disc, and I'll grab a disc here for reference. Uh, you want to put the disc, if you're holding your hand up like you're giving someone a high five, put the rim of the disc between your uh, pointer and your middle finger and knuckle, okay? You want it to sit um, under your top knuckle and then wrap your fingers around it, whether you do fan grip or power grip, and place your thumb uh, in between the flight plate and the rim in the comfortable position there. That's going to naturally put the disc in a nose down position. And when you couple that with keeping your thumb flush with your forearm, you're going to have more success with nose down. So that's the first thing you want to do. And you'll never hit this gap if you don't keep the nose down because it's just going to lift the disc. The next thing is to work on aiming. Now, Obviously, accuracy is super important, but um, this is a smaller window than a lot of disc golfers are used to. And when you start working on this out at uh, the field or on the course, you're going to notice some fairly uh, similar issues like, oh, I missed that gap, that's very specific gap, when you're used to take being able to throw through an entire window of space. Uh, so working on aim, and so one of the things that I've always taught and I've implemented in my own game when I'm trying to be accurate. I want to pick the gap I'm trying to hit and I want to pick something off in the distance um, to aim through the gap. What that helps is it sort of um, hyper focuses your attention on your hit spot, on your hit box, right? And it uh, it helps you think past where you're aiming. See, a lot of times we're like, okay, I wanna hit this imaginary space between these two trees, but because you're so close to potentially where you're throwing, you see the trees that you're trying to avoid and, you're, and then your eyes end up focusing on the tree and then you know what happens? You end up hitting the tree, okay? And so what, uh, something that I do and I try to teach others to do and I'm telling you this to give it a shot aim through the gap. If you have two trees or a telephone pole or just a, a window of space that you're aiming, pick something off in the distance that sits in that window and aim at that. That will help you throw through the gap instead of to the gap. So keeping that nose down, working on that accuracy. And as we build these skills, because this is something that I'm going to start working on as well, because it is super helpful, but as we build these skills, we will be able to translate them to all the different courses that we play, whether local courses or if you travel around the country and have the opportunity to go visit other courses, you'll be able to start doing this. And you will adapt once you have accuracy to generating that power because this is also teaching good form. Aiming, your accuracy is important. Nose down throws are incredibly important for distance. You don't have to throw 80 miles an hour to throw 400 feet or to even throw 300 feet. You can throw 50, 45. I mean, you could probably throw 40, 45 miles an hour and hit 300 feet if you have good nose angle. And so really all about it's, distance has, is more about the angle of the release the angle of the disc in the air, meaning nose up or nose down, and your form and follow through. How clean is it? Are you throwing with your arm or are you allowing your body to guide the disc across your chest and out of your hand? And so we're, as we work on this specific skill of hitting a gap, hitting this window, 
we're going to start having our distance compound into it and better form is going to lead to better accuracy and better distance. And really it helps us end up throwing like Calvin Heimberg. And that's why his skill set travels all over the country with him and he can play so well um, in so many different places. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not at all taking away the practice and just the talent that he has. There, there is something to be said to that. But when you look at the way he throws, even for some distance lines, like unless there's some elevation or he's going massive distance, like trying to hit 600, 650 feet, Calvin doesn't throw um, super high off the ground all the time. He will throw a screaming 400, 450 foot shot. That's just 10 feet off the ground. And that's because that's what he grew up doing and playing in Florida, uh, in Clearwater, which is not too far from Tampa. And so this is a really important skill that I think all of us need to learn. I wanted to share that with you. Now, I'm working on this skill um, <clears throat> and I'm seeing improvement already as I'm working in different rounds. But I wanna encourage you that if you are struggling with this skill, please reach out to me on GiveGo or in my Discord and the community there can help you. In GiveGo, I can give you one-on-one -on -one coaching and can uh, assist you and give you some uh, immediate feedback and detailed feedback as to what you need to work on. Uh, in Discord, you can get community feedback and people giving you advice on what to do, maybe some drills that will help and that kind of thing. So super awesome community community there. I want, you, I want to encourage you to check it out. So that is the disc golf skill, aiming low, hitting our gap with accuracy and eventually getting that speed and distance to compound with it. Now, before I get into the disc review, I want to just give one last shout out and I'm wearing the shirt now. So for people who are watching the video here on YouTube, you'll see it or on Spotify. If you're watching the video, you'll see it. But I'm wearing a Maui Strong shirt. You've seen me probably posting about this the last couple of weeks. This is a fundraiser shirt that Gladiator Disc Golf community is raising to donate to the Maui Strong Fund in support of the people of Lahaina on the island of Maui who suffered great tragedy at the wildfires a couple weeks ago. This fundraiser is coming to an end on Saturday, uh, September 9th. I'm looking, I'm looking at the date here on my, uh, my computer. September 9th, so that way we can go and donate the money. And here's the thing. For these shirts, all proceeds from every purchase of the Maui Strong shirts goes directly to the Maui Strong Fund. So if you've already purchased a shirt, thank you. And if you haven't yet, you are running out of time. So I wanna encourage you to join this cause and let's help these people on the island of Maui get their uh, life back together and get the necessities that they need for life, food, water, shelter, um, and those kinds of things. So please go ahead. You can order down below in YouTube or uh, you can go to my Instagram or gladiatordiscolf.myshopify.com and you can order in all the different apps there. So thank you so much. Now let's go ahead and let's get into our disc review. This week's disc review is sponsored by OTB Discs. As I mentioned last week, they hooked me up with this sweet looking Innova Aero. This disc is so pretty, reminds me of cotton candy. Uh, super, super cool disc. To quickly recap some of the things that I said last week, it's a three speed, six glide, zero turn, zero fade putt and approach disc. The Innova Aero is the first disc Innova ever made. Now you might be saying, Antonio, if I look on PDGA, there's something called the Eagle parentheses old. Yes, the first disc Innova actually made was the Eagle. But the Eagle was this disc, the Arrow. It was rebranded a couple months later to be this putter. And so the Innova Arrow was originally the Innova Eagle. And when you consider that it was the first disc they made in 1983, 40 years ago, it's understandable why it feels the way that it does. At this point, a lot of people were playing uh, obstacle disc golf. They didn't have baskets and they were using Frisbees, Ultimate Frisbees, Ultra Stars, those kinds of things, Whammo Frisbees. And so a disc like the Arrow has a very similar feel to an Ultimate Frisbee. It's domey, it's tall, it's wide, okay? It's not you know the widest disc out there, but it feels very similar to an Ultimate disc, which is why it is super easy to transfer over. Now, in this particular plastic, the Halo plastic, 
You could definitely get this disc to turn, hyzer flip if you put a lot of power into it. I never fully ripped on it because I was trying to learn it and I didn't find it to be incredibly understable. In fact, I found it to be pretty true to the numbers when I would throw it. I didn't get a lot of turn, I also didn't get a lot of fade. In fact, the fade that I got from this disc was typically just because of the halo plastic itself being a touch more stable than a, a DX or a, pro plastic might be for this disc. Now when I did throw it harder, not at, not really like rip on it or anything, I would find that it flies very, very straight. There's not a lot of left to right movement. Like I mentioned, it does have a slow fade at the end, but this disc will hold the line that you put it on. I threw it on some Anheuser angles and some hyzer angles. And what's really cool is that it holds the line reliably without uh, burn and turn kind of deal. And it's definitely not a spike hyzer. It's gonna be a nice glow, uh, glidey soft hyzer line. And so definitely a really cool backhand disc. Now this disc is 100% not forehand friendly. I did not even try it, but it just feels you know gross to try and uh, forehand. Like if I you know pick it up here, it just feels like the dome is in a weird spot. I don't really like it. I feel like it's gonna wobble out of my hand. The backhand's a little bit better. Okay, uh, but even still, this disc is too tall for my liking. I would not bag a disc like this nowadays. Maybe when I first started playing disc golf five and a half years ago, I maybe would have loved to have a disc like this because I played Ultimate Frisbee for years in college, and this would have been a great translation over to disc golf. But this disc, I looked it up on a PDGA, and they measured this disc at 2.5 centimeters tall. It is a tall disc. For context, I used a bullet for putting and for throwing, and the bullet is 1.8 centimeters tall. That is a 0.7 centimeter difference in height. And so when you're used to throwing something more shallow, like a ringer, a roach, a bullet, um, even, uh, what, what's the disc? Uh, I'm thinking stabilizer from Streamline, but it's not that, the pilot, the pilot, things that are a little bit more shallow, um, the arrow is going to feel very different in your hand. Now, if you like big putters, uh, like tall putters, or you have bigger hands, you might really like the Innova Arrow. Um, it has a lot of glide. Guys, that six glide is so true. This disc, um, it just seems to glide forever, and it feels so slow while it's in the air, but it is doing it. And what's really cool is that it is a piece of history. This is the first mold that Innova ever made. And so that is really cool to have it. Uh, obviously, this is not original plastic. I would be afraid to throw an Innova Arrow from 1983 because I'm pretty sure it would break. Like, it would hit the ground and just shatter, uh, let alone hitting a tree. So... Very cool disc, very cool piece of history. You might really like this disc if you, like I said, if you like the taller putter, if you really want a nice straight flying putter that's not gonna have a lot of left to right movement and one that you can throw on a multitude of angles and have it hold that angle. It's not gonna fight out of it too fast uh, for an Anheuser line. It's also not gonna burn and turn on that Anheuser line. And if you want that glidey hyzer, this could be the disc for you. So if you want, go ahead and head to otbdiscs.com to check it out. Use discount code GladiatorDG to save on shipping. Now let's get to probably one of the best things that happened last weekend. And when I say one of, I mean the absolute best thing to happen last weekend. And that was the 20, oh, wow, I really messed that up. That is the 2023 PVGA world championships man i really messed that up <laughs> with all with all the stop and go but worlds guys it was so much fun to watch i really really enjoyed it it was so entertaining it was so good and i just really had a good time watching i was watching post produce and it was just a lot of fun it was great to kind of just see uh these courses you know smugglers notch was just such a great choice for worlds it was the same location for worlds in 2018 where greg barsby won and uh, Paige bjerkis who is now Paige shu uh where they won their one and only world championships for each of them uh this worlds was a little different though this one was a little different 
Kristen Tatar was there and she led from wire to wire. She uh, played so, so well. Now there were a few times where her lead was cut pretty close. Um, Missy actually got within one stroke of, uh, of uh, Kristen Tatar in the fourth round, I believe. But then Kristen was able to take it back to a three or five stroke lead and then eventually win by a couple strokes. Uh, Missy did have a chance. There were a couple missed opportunities throughout the tournament, but it was really cool to actually see someone compete with Kristen because as we'll get to the results later, if Missy wasn't playing as well as she was, Worlds would have been over after round two. Like you can almost even argue after round one, but I mean, it was a five round event. So let's give benefit of the doubt. After round two, <laughs> it would have basically been over had it not been for Missy. And so that was really, uh, really nice to see, really fun. I was really sad though, and I'm sure you guys were too. Own Scoggins DNF'd. And if you don't know, that means did not finish. Um, sometime in round one, beginning of round two, she was dealing with injury and she finished round two like a champ, but she had to drop out after that. Um, it's a bummer. Because last year in the USDGC, she played most of the tournament on uh, a pulled groin, I think it was, or some kind of injury in her lower body and her legs. Maybe it was a hamstring or something. But I think it was a groin. And she played, but she didn't perform as well. She had a couple throws in USDGC last year. Uh, USWDGC, I, I think, is the acronym for the Women's uh, US Disc Golf Championship. Uh, she had a couple of throws that ended up going OB because she just couldn't generate the power. So I'm proud of her for, you know, being, you know, saying, you know, I'm not going to push through three more rounds of this, three and a half more rounds of this. I'm just going to do more damage to my body. I'm not going to play well. That's a hard decision, but I think it's the right decision to make because now she can hopefully heal up and be ready for uh, U.S. championships. Now we'll see. I sure hope so, but we shall see. Now, FPO, yes, Kristen led from wire to wire. There were a few moments it was close, but FPO, everybody was pretty confident that Kristen Tatar was going to win. MPO, on the other hand, was a complete toss-up even going into round five. Yes, Isaac Robinson, in case you didn't know, he is your 2023 PDGA MPO World Champion. But... He was not leading the tournament all weekend. And in fact, there was a moment in the final round where Eagle got within one stroke at one point. Around hole 14, I think it was. Hole 14, 15. So this was becoming anybody's tournament throughout the weekend. You had almost different lead cards every single day. You might have had a few people carry over. We had some surprise lead cards with Grady Shu on in round three, I believe it was, he was on the lead card. Um, just a very interesting weekend for the MPO division. Very cool to see. Uh, but I gotta say, I'm very, very happy for Isaac Robinson. But it's kind of hard to believe that he won a world championship before Chris Dickerson, Simon Lazat, Eagle McMahon, and Matty O. Now, it's not anything to take away from Isaac, but I mean, the dude's like 22, and there are all these other guys who are much older. I mean, Eagle and Simon have been playing for like a decade now, or uh, Simon, you know, being on the Pro Tour over a decade now. Eagle being on the Pro Tour for nearly a decade. I think it's been about eight to eight or nine years. And Matt Eo was in the World Championships in 2006 and seven, I believe, uh, wearing the A-Rod jersey when it was the final round was just nine holes, I believe. So, and then Chris has just been so consistently good and he's really improved on the tail end of this season. Um, it's hard to believe that some of those guys haven't won yet. Uh, but you know, that just goes to show you the future of professional disc golf is so bright because there are so many amazing young players coming into, coming out of the woodwork, coming from all over the country and playing really, really well. Anthony Barella finished second on the podium, okay? Um, I'm excited to see what the future holds for him. I'm excited to see what the future holds for Isaac. Um, super, super happy for him. It's got to be an incredible feeling. It was so cool seeing the first person to congratulate him and cheer and, and be there for, excuse me, and be there for him and support him was his brother Ezra. 
that's got to be a super special moment between the two brothers where after all the years of them playing together and growing and developing and building their game that they that he's now a world champion and his brother Ezra's brother is a world champion he's getting to witness that that's such a cool experience I'm super happy for him but now let's go bigger picture outside of the winners what does this mean for Prodigy in the offseason? You know, I've asked this in a couple of disc golf communities. If you're on my Discord, you know that we've talked about this a little bit. Yes, in the, in the very beginning of the season, Gannon Burr was all of a sudden like, I'm not throwing Prodigy anymore. I'm done. Wiping his hands, he's going to start throwing some other stuff. Then you had the whole big lawsuit thing. Then he came back fulfilling his agreement and all that stuff. He's had a pretty good year. He's played really well. Now you have Isaac, who's also played. He's won two majors this year. You also have Ezra, who's playing really well. You have Alden Harris, who's playing well, who was in the mix a little bit in the top 10 there. You also still have Kevin Jones on your team. And so Prodigy, what are they going to do this offseason? Now, someone made a good point in my Discord that they said Prodigy kind of has a history of not paying players, which is true. For those of you who might be fairly new to uh, disc golf over the last, you know, two, three years, let's say, when you've come, that you've come into it, you may not know this, but a lot of pros have been sponsored by Prodigy throughout their career. Jeremy Colink, Paul Ulibarri, Ricky Wysocki, Paige Pierce, many, many others have been sponsored. Uh, Chris Dickerson. Okay, if you're super fairly new, you may only know Chris Dickerson on Discraft, but he was on Prodigy before. I believe even Matty O was on Prodigy. So a lot of pros have crossed paths with Prodigy, and yet none of them are still with it. And so there's definitely some history about Prodigy, you know, not paying players who move a lot of plastic, what they require. Katrina Allen was on Prodigy. So, you know, there's a lot of this history that they have to address. Because to be fair to all of those players, um, the talent that Prodigy has right now might be the best group of talent that they've had. They did lose Gavin Babcock last year to Discmania, but Gavin hasn't really been, even when he was with Prodigy, really competing for wins and everything like this core group of players are. And it would be such a mistake, in my opinion, for Prodigy to let them go. They have got to find a way to pay them. And that being said, I know a lot of people believe that Gannon's going to leave. And logically, it makes all the sense in the world. But I am having such a hard time thinking that that's going to happen. I don't, I don't know. I can't explain it. I really, really can't. But I just have a gut feeling that after this season, Gannon's going to stay with Prodigy. I don't know why. It's just a gut feeling. Like I said, it's illogical. It doesn't make sense for him to stay when he has so many other opportunities out there. But if they can give him the money, if they can give him the discs and really elevate him to, you know, uh, financially to, to greatness in a sense, and he's been playing great. He's already a USDGC champ among other champs, uh, you know, other, other tournaments he's won. Um, that would be really good for them because the last thing that you want is to lose someone like Gannon who then can potentially start talking to Isaac when his contract comes up to be like, hey man, you should come over here. I, you, Obviously, I was with Prodigy. I'm telling you, these companies are better, this, that, and the other thing. Last thing you want is to slowly start losing them. There, are, Kevin Jones is staying, but Kevin Jones has his own line of discs that Prodigy is investing in. So my guess is as good as yours. I would love to hear what you think. Is Prodigy going to be able to keep this young core of MPO golfers on their team? Or are they slowly going to lose them and are they going to get poached by other manufacturers? We know Discraft will definitely be in play. No one knows what Innova is doing with their money. Dynamic Discs uh, and Trilogy really haven't really shown that they're willing to spend a lot of money except on players like Ricky and Kona. Um, So who knows what's happening with them. So it'll be really interesting with Discmania and Discraft in my opinion. I don't want anyone else to go to Discraft. But you never know what happens. So let me know in the comments below. Um, what what do you think? What do you think? Are they going to keep them or are they going to lose them? So let's go ahead now and let's wrap this up by uh, going. The, let's wrap up Worlds 
by talking about the final results. So MPO, we'll start with MPO. Isaac Robinson, first place, minus 46. Anthony Barella, second place, minus 44. Tied for third, Eagle McMahon and Matty O at minus 43. He only won by two strokes. It was so close, guys. Fifth place, Calvin Heinberg, minus 42. Tied for sixth, Gannon Burr, Alden Harris, Kyle Klein at minus 41. And in ninth place, Chris Dickerson at minus 40. And in 10th place, James Proctor at minus 39. Guys, seven strokes separated the top 10. That is just incredible. And then 11th place, Simon Lazat, minus 38. Gotta just throw him in there. And Ricky Wasaki in 12th at minus 37. So we had nine strokes separating the top 12. That's just incredible golf being played. Uh, on the FPO side, little different story. First place, Kristen Tatar, minus 26. Second place, Missy Gannon, minus 20. Six stroke victory. And this is why I said after day two, Things were probably, you know, we if it wasn't for Missy Gannon, things probably would have been wrapped up. Because in third place, Holland Hanley, minus 14, a 12-stroke difference. Fourth place, we had a tie. Evelina Solonen and Hannah Blomrus, the Euros, minus 9. Uh, sixth place, Silva Saarinen, minus 8. Seventh place, Macy Bella Diaz, Valerie Mandahano, Ali Smith, Lucky Lorenzen at minus 6. And in 11th place, Katie Tate at minus one. So really cool to see the top 10, technically top 11, uh, all under par for Worlds in the FPO division. That is super, super cool to see. And I believe this is a record of Euros in the top 10 at Worlds. We have one, uh, two, three, four, five, six in the top 11. Uh, and so that is very, very cool to see. I'm very happy for Evelina Solonen. Uh, she clearly has improved her game and her putting. It She's putting with more confidence. Uh, still missing some here or there, but definitely putting with more confidence. So that is the 2023 PDGA Worlds. It was so much fun to watch. Now let's go ahead and let's wrap up this episode by just touching on the upcoming tournament. So we have the Discmania Open in Canada this weekend. And there's not a lot that I'm going to say about it simply because as I'm looking through the players there, there's not a ton of top tier pros. There's uh, very, in the grand scheme of things, there are more 900 something rated players than there are 1,000 rated players, 1,000 plus rated players at this tournament. And I think there are a few reasons for that. One, people don't want to travel internationally right now just for the sake of time because next week is the MVP Open at Maple Hill. And I've already seen several pros are already there in Massachusetts practicing the course. And for a few reasons, the, the Discmania Open in Canada is not a playoff event. MVP Open is a playoff event for Disc Golf Pro Tour standings and uh, the championship at the end of the year. So that's where most of the pros that we are uh, that are missing from uh, the, can, uh, the Discmania Open in Canada, those that are missing from there are prepping for, um, wow, for MVP Open. Drew, drew a blank there. Sorry about that. Uh, I am not anticipating on seeing someone like Paul McBeth over the next few weeks. He struggled at Worlds. It's the first time since 2011 was the last time that he did not place first or second in Worlds. He went 10 straight years placing first or second at the world championships. And he did not this year. We didn't even mention him in the top 12. He has been dealing with some injuries. And so it's understandable that he was not able to perform up to the level that we normally see from Paul Macbeth and that we expect from him and that he expects from himself. So it'll be interesting to see if he's at MVP open in a couple weeks. Um, I think I did hear Rumor that he was basically shutting down for the season after Worlds. Um, I did not think to fact check that, so I could be wrong, but I think I did hear that. So um, let me, well, yeah, and that's basically it. I mean, next week we'll talk about MVP Open. There's not much to say about the Discmania Open in Canada. I'm sure it's going to be a beautiful course. Uh, the Canadian courses are always beautiful, especially when they've been on Prince Edward Island. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see coverage of this. I'm excited to watch it. It's disc golf. It's going to be beautiful courses. We're going to get to see some players we normally wouldn't get to see. So that should be really fun. 
and just maybe see maybe some potential pros over the next couple of years who we're seeing them in their learning and growing phase. So that's very cool. But that is all that I have for you this week, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, we started talking about a very important disc golf skill, and that is learning to throw low lines, consistently hitting your gaps with accuracy and distance. We want to keep that nose down, and we want to aim through a gap not to a gap. And that is basically what we see from someone like Calvin Heimberg out on tour doing very, very well. After that, we reviewed the Innova Arrow, a very cool putt and approach disc. One that I don't necessarily love to throw because it wasn't working for me great, but you might really like it because it's a nice tall putter. And at the end of the day, it's a piece of history. We recapped Worlds and then we previewed Discmania Open and we will preview the MVP Open next week uh, with a little bit more detail. So that is all that I have for you today, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, whichever, wherever you're listening. Please leave a review if you're on the podcast app, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It would help me so, so much. And tell all other disc golfers out there, hey, check out this podcast. Don't forget to go out and play some disc golf this weekend. Teach someone how to play. Encourage them. Take them out. Give them some discs if you have an abundance of discs. Go ahead and donate some to some people to teach them how to play. Make sure you have fun out on the course. And until next time, everybody, have a great round.